Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Torah Studies and uh, this Parshas uh, Shmini. And the topic today, don't be a good person. Be a godly person. It's a lot harder and better. So, it is... Um, Obviously, when we come, people, when they think about what is the right thing to do, to follow the right way, to do the right thing, why do we do what we want to do? Sometimes this, there's a ethically ambiguous situation. Um, when you do something, and you want to gain benefit from it, should you do it for benefit, or do you do it for, for, in an altruistic way? It comes, sometimes it could be uh, people who are scientists, doctors, they're doing things, and you can do things because it's going to benefit you, Or you can do things because you want to benefit the public. There's, a, there's a Dr. Jonas Salk, 1952. He develops the vaccine for polio. And about 3,000 people died from the disease. And when he came out, it was in a radio show in 1952, and he said he's going to, he found a vaccine. And he refused to um, to register this as his uh, to patent patent his his vaccine. He said, "Is this is for the public?" He refused to benefit from this. So, is is it really not okay to benefit? So, we're going to learn the lesson from something that is mentioned in the parsha. But, more importantly, in the Mishnah, the Mishnah concludes with this particular law. And that is the law of the impurities. The, there is a concept that sounds a little funny. There is kosher for impurity. Anybody heard about the kosher for impurity? It makes something kosher to become impure heksha lekabel tuma in hebrew and on that <coughs> for the scholars among you that already sounds familiar um, which basically means that is mentioned in this week's torah portion there are things that make us impure a dead body makes us impure the things that can become impure, different items that can become impure. Food can also become impure. Fruits, vegetables can also become impure. However, in order for vegetables to become impure, they need to become kosher for, for becoming pure. What does that mean, kosher? They need to be qual become qualified to receive impurities. What makes them qualified and prepared to receive impurities? This is only if water, a liquid, some fell on it willingly. If it was, if if it fell on on it uh, any liquid, then it becomes impure. Then it becomes qualified that if it touches a dead body or something else. It becomes impure. Now, but this is only if the water or the other liquids, if it falls on the fruit after it was harvested. Because otherwise, every fruit would be considered qualified to become impure because the rain comes on it. So after it was harvested, and if the water came on it, 
then it becomes muksha lekabel tumah kosher for impurity or qualified to receive impurities. So that's the basic. There's a lot of laws regarding it. I just gave over the basics, what that means, and soon we'll, we'll tell you why we are talking about this and what is the lesson what we can learn from this. So, wrong screen. There you go. The researchers have the right to withhold their discoveries for personal gain. Okay, so this is the verse that we read in this week's Torah portion. Mikol oichel, asher ya'achel, asher ya'vol of maim itma. All foods that are commonly eaten are fit to become contaminated, impure, after water or liquid that are commonly drunk in any vessel come upon it all right and the maimonides explains it clearly in the halacha what that means of what we just explained all food edible to humans such as bread meat grapes olives and the like can become impure it does not become impure unless it's first touched by one of the seven liquids this is called kosher for impurity heksha becomes pre prepared to become impure as the verse states if water is put upon a seed and afterwards the seed is contaminated by impure uh, dead uh, creatures it is impure. It's a verse in Leviticus. Now, says the Rambam, the Maimonides, these are the seven liquids that render edible foods kosher for impurity. What are they? Water, dew, oil, wine, animal fat, blood, and honey. What we are going to focus today is on the honey. The honey, our sages tell us in the Mishnah, in the very last part of the Mishnah, of the, the entire Mishnah, it talks about the honey that makes, that makes um, kosher to become pure. In, uh, to become impure. Now the question is, at what point does the honey, the honey, become a liquid? At what point is it considered liquid? Because the honey is a uh, congealed honeycomb, and what happens? Uh, we smoke out the the, hunt, the bees, and then we break it and it turns into honey. So at what point exactly is the honey considered as a liquid that if it touches a food, it makes the food prepared to receive impurities? Okay? So again, food that comes into contact with water or other liquid, including honey, and become wet, are fit to become contaminated if subsequently touched by something impure. And by the way, what is, what is, what is the uh, significance what is the ramification of becoming impure? There's different ramifications. A person who is impure cannot enter the holy temple. You know, I spoke about the red heifer this week. That we read last week to become purified again. 
So there's different, different ramifications. But the question that we asked is, at what point does the honey, is the honey begin to be considered the liquid to make the food uh, ready to be contaminated? And that is the Mishnah that we quote, Mishnah from Uktzin. It is the, actually the second of the last Mishnah of the entire Talmud, the entire Mishnah. And it says, At what point do honeycombs become susceptible to impurity? Meaning, at what point do they become liquids? So the school of Shammite is the famous uh, arguments or disagreements between the house of Shammai, the house of Hillel, many times in the Mishnah we find them arguing. So the school of Shammai said, when you begin to smoke out the bees, when you begin to smoke out the bees, that's already, you have already in mind to take this honeycomb and turn them into honey, so that already makes it ready. Now once, once you smoked out the bees and it touches the food, and it makes it qualified to become impure. The school of Hila says, when you break up the honeycomb. All right. So, that's the, to summarize, at what point does the honey assume a halachic state of liquid? Bet Shammai says, honeycomb, uh, honey becomes a liquid when you begin to smoke out the bees. Bet Hillel says, Honey becomes a liquid when you break up the honeycomb. And the question is, why? Why does the final mission in the Talmud discuss honeycombs and beehives? When you're talking about the, the Mishnah, the Torah, Anytime the Torah discusses something, brings something, there is significance. Certainly, when we are talking about concluding the entire Torah, the entire Mishnah, the choice of put, placing that particular law regarding honeycombs and, and honeybees, there must be something symbolic, there must be something that we can learn from this. There must be a reason why this was placed, where it was placed in the, in the end of the Talmud, the end of the Mishnah. So, and the answer is in short, is because there comes, the Talmud comes to teach us that there is something that we can learn from the bees that guides us in our life of serving Hashem, guides us, helps us to understand the way we are supposed to serve Hashem. We are supposed to live our life as Jews. See, most of us aspire to live a virtuous life. Why do we want to be good? Because it feels good. It feels good to be good. Why do I, if I see a peddler begging, uh, asking for money, I give him the money. Why do I do it? It makes me feel good. I think it's the right thing to help somebody. And the same thing, we can ask the questions regarding the mitzvahs in general. God gave us commandments to do. And we are supposed to observe those mitzvahs, the mitzvahs that Hashem commands us. Why do we do them? What is the reason we do the mitzvahs? You can say it is you want to make Hashem happy. Or you want it's for us, for our good. 
It is a, actually a deep philosophical question, which we're not going to go into it tonight, about what does it mean to make Hashem happy? How do you, uh, is there anything that Hashem lacks that we need to make Him happy, to make Him fulfill something? But this is a, a deeper question. We spoke about it in the Tanya Shir more. Basic idea is that really Hashem is beyond not needing. I know it may, may sound a little deep, a little confusing. You say Hashem is not is not needy, he doesn't need anything. But if you but if you say that Hashem doesn't need anything, that means that you're saying that Hashem is missing something. Is missing being needy. And yet Hashem is beyond that. Hashem is kol yachol. He is the all capable, all able. So that's a deep discussion. When, and again, we're not going into this particular part. But in general, when we're asking the question, what is it, what is it do we, we do the mitzvahs for? Is it for us? Is it for Hashem? So what is interesting, that we do find in our, in the Talmud, in the, among the sages, in the Torah, we find both things, both approaches. We find that what the Torah tells us, that doing the Torah, doing the mitzvahs, is something we do it for our good, for our benefit. Let's see it inside. Here's a pasuk, a verse in Deuteronomy that says, "Lishmoi es mitzvah is Hashem v'eschokaisa v'asher onichim etzavcha ayoyim letoiv lach." To observe all God's commandments and all the edicts that I command you today for your good. Clearly, Torah tells us that God gave us commandments for your good because they benefit us. As the Nachmanides explains, God asks nothing of you that is for his benefit, only for your benefit. <coughs> it is all for your good. There you have it. The commandments are not for God, they are for us. So people often, often wonder why why do God why does God ask us all these details that God really care if I make spring cleaning uh, on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday morning? Does mitzvahs commandments to do do this, don't do that? So this is what our sages tell us that the good that we gain from the mitzvahs is two things. It is to refine us, to make us better people. And it is for the reward that we get. So mitzvahs are not for God, they are for us. We benefit from the discipline and rewards. And this is another verse in Deuteronomy, that in this verse we can see that the reward the benefit is both in this world and in the world to come. The Torah says God commands us to observe all these laws, to revere God for our per per perpetual good, and to live on th this day. So the text specifies two benefits here. You see there's the perpetual good, and to live life on this day. And this is the way Rabbi Nebachia, a 12th century sage, that's the way he explains it. This is a clear statement that a reward awaits us in the afterlife. This answers 
with finality the question that has bothered young people for generations. Now they can believe, understand, and know that observance of God com God's commandments is rewarding for both body and soul. The physical body, the physical reward, is, pro is the promise of the Holy Land, which includes all the benefits of life in this world. It also includes the promise of serenity and prosperity, for it is a land that flows with milk and honey. The spiritual reward is implied by the words for our perpetual good. This is an important principle. Remember it always. So this is where we see about the reward. The mitzvahs, we get the reward in this world, the world to come. Then there is the other element, the element of refinement, that the mitzvahs are there also to refine, to make us better people. As the mother says, why would God care if we slaughter from the neck or from the nape? Rather, the commandments were only given to us to refine us. How does the observing the commandments refine our nature? So an example is given by the Nachmanides. The Nachmanides writes as follows. Each commandment has a reason and purpose that rectifies our human nature in addition to the reward that we receive from he who commanded it. The commandments are not intended to benefit God, rather they are intended to benefit us. They shield us from toxicity, caustic belief, and shameful traits. They also help us remember God's wondrous miracles and know God. So basically all the mitzvahs, all of the commandments are there for us, are there to make us better people, to remember, to remember the connection, our connection to God, to remember the miracles of God, and so on and so forth. Observing mitzvahs, continues the Nachmanides, is like refining silver. One who refines silver does not act without purpose. The purpose is to extract all impure base metals from the silver. And similarly, God's commandments uproot negative beliefs from our hearts, teach us the truth, and empower us to remember it always. Our sages, our sages offer the mitzvah of shechita slaughtering as proof. Slaughtering from the neck doesn't produce greater glory or benefit to God than slaughtering from the nape. Rather, the purpose is to habituate us to the path of compassion, even as we slaughter. Slaughtering in the kosher way, is the most compassionate way and most painless way that you can do to kill the chicken or whatever the animal that, the kosher animal that you want to eat. Here's another example. Does God really care if we eat kosher food that the Torah calls pure or unkosher food that the Torah says is impure for you rather it is it is to render us pure of soul wise of mind and perceptive of the truth thus this, uh, this, the passage states if you are wise it is to your benefit as it is true of these two commandments so is it true of all commandments Shaking the lulav, sitting in the sukkah, laying the tefillin, which is a sign and a reminder that God extracted us from Egypt. They are not for God's glory. They are 
him being compassionate towards us. It is all intended for our good, not for God's good. The purpose of every mitzvah is to refine and cleanse us of all negative thoughts and shameful th- traits. So, yes, the rewards is great. In addition to that, we didn't we didn't even mention the fact what the Torah says that if you follow my laws, have all the all the good physical goods will be there. That's that's not not even as a reward. That is part of the working conditions that Hashem says if you commit your life to Torah. If you commit your life to serve God, then Hashem will provide the conditions that you will be able to serve God. So that's not even as, as a reward. So here's another example from the Chacham Tzvi, Rabbi Tzvi Ashkenazi. And he's in the 16th century. He says as follows, Also when the Jewish army lays siege to a non-Jewish city, we are commanded to leave one side of the city exposed for any citizen that wishes to escape. Very apropos these days. Surrounding Gaza. We're supposed to give them a place to escape. The problem is, it's not Israel that stops them. <laughs> it is Egypt and, and all of the Arab countries doesn't want anybody to escape there. They want them all to suffer there. But in any case, that's uh, <laughs> getting off track. So this is the law. When you fall, the law of, of war is to let them have a place to escape. We are even commandment to avoid causing pain to animals that cannot speak. Do not slaughter an animal and its son on the same day. Similarly, the commandment to send away the mother before removing eggs or chicks from the nest, even with respect to vegetations, even with respect to vegetations. We are instructed, do not destroy its trees wantonly. There's an interesting uh, story. The previous Rebbe was once uh, walking with his father, taking a walk. And there was a bush, and, the pre- and they were talking, they were talking, interesting conversation. And the, and, and the previous rabbi was taking off, uh, cutting off a leaf from a bush. It was just, uh, did, did it so without thinking. And his father asked him, what are you doing? Who gave you permission? to take a, a vegetation and turn it into an inanimate, cut off from its source of life and make it an inanimate object. So obviously, when we need them, God created them for us, but for no reason, just to cut it off. Here is an example. So all this is for us, the servants, to implant true beliefs and good and proper traits in our souls to refine us for our benefit. So, the summary of all of these texts, what does it lead us to understand? The mitzvahs is for our good. You're being kind. Why are we being kind? It makes us better people. Keeping Shabbos. Make, give us the belief in Hashem. The Torah, we study Torah. It's for our benefit. But is that really the ultimate way? Why we do the mitzvahs? Is this really why we do what we do? The answer is no. It is yes, the Torah says that is a part why the Torah gives it. It's for our benefit to, to refine us. But 
is that the ultimate reason why we serve Hashem? Ultimately, we serve Hashem for a deeper reason, something that is connected with the essence. And this, in this lesson, we learn from the honeybees. So we'll talk a little bit about the honey and the bees. We'll read a couple of articles. The way the system works. Maybe some of you know it. I was not aware of all the details, but it's interesting anyway. So the laws that God has commanded us serve to discipline and refine our character, but is much deeper. So here's an article from OU Kosher. Honeybees are divided into three groups called castes. They are the single queen bee, several hundred male drones, and thousands of female worker bees. The queen bee is the mother of all bees and keeps at her task with dodged uh, consistency. She will lay about 1,500 eggs a day, each spring and summer. She is groomed for the role, having been chosen as young, as a young, promising, but altogether average larva by her assistants. The legion of drone bees and fed a secret potion known as royal jelly, a special, a special super rich superfood, as we might call it, produced in the heads of worker nurse bees. Okay. Drones, true to their name, don't do much, but wait for it, the chance to mate with the queen. So the drones are the male bees. Only one drone in a thousand will live to do so. Okay? The worker bees do more than cuddling the queen. They are the rank and file workers of the hive, doing the lion's share of daily colonial chores, including feeding the drones and growing the brood, keeping the hive's temperature steady, and preparing the hive's food source, pollen-rich bee bread. And to our fortune, that liquid gold itself, honey. For all its hard work, the worker bee, in the six to eight weeks of her life, and having flown a total of one and a half times the circumference of the earth in her travels, ends up producing a mere twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. In fact, all those twelve teaspoons add up to a lot of honey. In New York and New Jersey combined, there are about 70,000 bee colonies producing over 3 million pounds of honey, a value of nearly $2 million, per the 2018 USDA Honey Report. Honey production in the entire United States last year totaled uh, at over 150 million pounds of honey at a value of over $330 million. Now, so think about think about that. This this honey, these worker honeys, they work a lifetime. They work to do what? To feed, to produce the honey, 
and the lifetime is very short and it does everything just to accomplish what it needs to do it has a mission to do and that's what it does here's another article the honeybee colony is an organized society of three adult uh, castes queen workers and drones each ca caste have certain responsibilities for the preservation of their hive queen who are responsible for producing and laying eggs live for an average of two to three years but have been known to live five years queen produce unfertilized eggs that hatch into drones the male or male honeybees the main purpose of a drone is to mate with the queen and their lifespan relates directly to this task if a mature drone successfully mates with a queen he will die soon after the mating the mating flight if he's unsuccessful in mating in the, the mating flight the drone will be ejected from his hive and at the end of the act of the active summer season and will eventually die of cold or starvation but so the drone doesn't work as hard as the worker bees but it has only one purpose and it is not self-satisfying there can be only two outcomes. A, he succeeds and dies because there is no further use for him. And B, he fails and he eject, is ejected because the hive doesn't tolerate slackers. Either way, the message is you don't exist for yourself. Your only purpose is to serve and this is the wonderful world of the of the of the bees and we never heard of a bee saying wait one wait a second why should i work so hard there's no rebel bees saying let me go take a vacation in miami these bees they work there created for that purpose and that's what they do and that is exactly the reason why the Mishnah chooses to speak about the honeybees about the honeycomb at the end of the Mishnah to teach us that when it comes when when we're, we're talking about keeping the Torah you study the whole Torah the whole Mishnah by the end of the day, you come to the bottom line. What is the bottom line? What is the ultimate way, the ultimate reason why we are here? Why did Hashem put us in this place? Is to serve Hashem like the honey serves its master. Like the, the honeybee serves its queen. That's the purpose. So when we say, we do the mitzvah to become better people. It's beautiful. But it's, you know what? It's not the ultimate reason. It is true. Yes, God wants us to live here, wants us to improve ourselves, and wants us to enjoy it. We have mitzvahs to enjoy ourselves also. Shabbos, other things, have nachas from the kids. But ultimately, what is the reason why we are here? We are here to serve Hashem. So the bees altruistic life purpose teaches us how our service to God should look, how fulfillment of the mitzvah should be for God's benefit, not for our own. And this is the mid the Madras says, Omar Rabbi Yehuda ben Rabbi Simon b'Shem Rabbi Levi, Rabbi Yehuda the son of Rabbi Shimon, of Rabbi Simon, said in the name of Rabbi Levi we are like the honeybee as the honeybee works only to benefit its queen so did the jewish people perform all the commandments and good deeds only for the benefit of the father in heaven
And as the Alter Rebbe explains this in Lekut Etere, says the Alter Rebbe, we cannot be our own ultimate purpose. Despite the wondrous benefits we derive from the commandments, we don't do them for ourselves, we do them for God's glory so that God can rejoice with his handiwork. Ismach Hashem b'maisav. When we study the Torah and observe the commandments, God experiences a supernal delight, a celestial pleasure within himself. Yes, it is true that we also receive boundless reward, in the world to come, as our sages said, a single moment of delight in the world to come is greater than all the pleasures of this world. Nevertheless, this is secondary to giving God the supernal delight that he experiences within himself. The essence of Hashem. He chose, God chose to enjoy, so to speak, from a dear a home in this low physical world. So God derives immense pleasure from our mitzvahs. However, the reason why he gave us the mitzvahs was not for his personal benefit, it was for ours. But we return the favor by setting aside our own benefit and making God's pleasure a priority. And here, the, that's what the Rebbe explains regarding the Mishnah. This is also why the final Mishnah discusses beehives and honeycombs. It is because the Im imperative to serve God for the sake of God is taught to us by the comparison of the Jewish people to bees. Let's take it a little, a little deeper. It's not only when we serve Hashem because we want to give pleasure to Hashem. It is also when we do something. Why, why do we do what we do? The Maimonides tells us the ultimate way is to do things because this is the right thing to do. Because this is the ultimate truth. Think about why, why the average person appreciates that we're not supposed to kill somebody. We're not supposed to murder. You can ask the average person, why, why, why is it wrong to murder? Why, can't you, why shouldn't you murder? Why shouldn't you kill somebody? You can come up with many different reasons. Why? It's not helpful for society. Or it can come back to hunt you. Revenge. Or you can go to prison. But is, is this the reason why we don't murder? The simple reason why we don't murder because it's not right. <laughs> it's the right thing to do, to not to kill somebody else. You know... In your, in your core, that this is not the right thing. So, when a Jew serves Hashem, does the mitzvahs, does the right thing, what Hashem wants, we do it when we recognize so deep what is Hashem, the truth of Hashem, to love Hashem. We follow the Torah mitzvahs. We know that this is the will of Hashem. If this is the will of Hashem, that this is then the ultimate truth. We do put on tefillin because that's the ultimate truth. We give tzedakah because that's the ultimate truth. That's what Hashem wants us. What Hashem wants is what we want, is what truly our neshama wants. So ultimately, says the Rambam, the Maimonides, that we serve Hashem not because we want to gain perfection, 
not because we want to gain um, reward in the world to come. We serve Hashem. Ultimately, the essence, when we reach the core of why we serve Hashem, it is because that is the truth. God is truth. Let's see what the Rambam says. Says the Memanides, one who serves God out of love occupies themselves in the Torah and the mitzvahs and walks in the path of wisdom for no ulterior motive, not because of fear that evil will occur, not in order to acquire benefit, rather they do what's true because it's true. And ultimately, good will come because of it. Yes, good will come, but this is not why we do it. The good will come, but that's only a side benefit. Ultimately, we do what Hashem wants that we should do. And that because that is the truth. As the Rebbe says, when a Jew serves God out of love in such a way that they do what's true because it's true. There is no ulterior motive to their service. Their only thought animating their service is their desire to fulfill God's will because it's true. For following God's command is the, is the objective truth. So I'll conclude with it. There's a story of, uh, written by Rabbi Chaim Nissenbaum. He's a shliach in France. So he wrote in, he, he grew up and uh, was raised in a traditional Jewish home, but was not observant until he was maybe 16 years old. And in 1968, he, um, he was um, close with Rabbi Mullah Zim of Olav Shalom, the Shliach, the head Shliach in France, who had a lot of influence, got a lot of young people together. And in 1972, Rabbi Azimov brought a group of young students to the Rebbe, to New York, to see the Rebbe. And at that time, this group were already uh, considered themselves Chabad Hasidim and they they all came and they were before entering uh, university they had the past examinations to enter the university but they wanted to go instead of university they wanted to go to yeshiva because they never really had the real yeshiva experience so they all came to the rabbi and Rabbi Yazimov asked the Rebbe on their behalf what they should do. So the Rebbe answered Rabbi Yazimov. He gave him a list of students and he checked on two columns a group of students to go to yeshiva and a group of students, the Rebbe said, they should continue in the university. And when they go to the university, they should also participate in Torah classes and to give over classes in the university also, the Torah classes. And then, um, he came also to the Rebbe and he had a private audience with the Rebbe. And in the private audience, they had the, each one they placed their questions, they prepared the questions, what they wanted to ask the Rebbe before, in advance, and they gave it into the Rebbe. And it says when he walked into the Rebbe's room, and the Rebbe had a pile of notes on his desk, the Rebbe pulled out one note, and it was exactly his note, he said he didn't, he, didn't, he couldn't figure out how the Rebbe knew that this note is the note that he wrote, it just, he wasn't looking for it, it was pulled out, and he started reading, giving away all the answers, 
through the questions that he asked. And he said, one of the questions he asked the Rebbe, he said, he doesn't know if he should continue doing what he's doing, teaching others. He says, I don't know if I have enough Ahavas Yisrael, love for my fellow Jews, to do this kind of work. He said, I found myself looking down at people, and I'm afraid of becoming arrogant. Maybe somebody else should do that, should take over. He was, he had this dilemma, and he was very honest with the Rebbe. He said, the Rebbe answered as follows. The Rebbe told him, you have to do all things that are good. He says, he says he understood this to mean that he should ask, that he shouldn't ask questions. He should do what is good because that is what matters. Not what I feel, but what I do. Now this Rabbi Chaim is uh, Chaim Schneer Nissenbaum. He's the Rabbi of uh, Beis Chaim Mushka Synagogue in Paris. And he's the spokesman of Chabad in France. So this is something, you know, we find Shluchim in general, you know, Sometimes it's very easy to go have your life, raise your children in a nice, warm Jewish environment, and enjoy both spiritual and physical life, have a good job. Instead, you devote yourself, you dedicate yourself, you say, what, do, what am I here for? Am I here for just to enjoy myself, just to become a better person? No. I'm here because I need to do what Hashem wants. What does Hashem want? Hashem wants to bring Mashiach. And this really is something that every person in any position can apply it to yourself. To look around, to see, why am I here this morning? I have some colleagues here. I can talk to them, mention about, oh, I had such a good experience in a class I saw <laughs> online. I had a, a good experience in a, in a shul with a kiddush. Let's come, let's uh, experience this. Share with what, what you have. This is the lesson of the honeybees. We've got to be like the honeybee. Don't worry, we're not going to die of starvation or cold. On the contrary, we will live. But this is why the whole entire Mishnah finishes with this message, the message how the Jew is compared to the honeybee. So that's the end of today's class. Thank you for joining. And Mir Hashem, we should all have... Succeed, succeed in our missions and bring Mashiach. Hi, Rabbi. Again. Hello again. I, I am. I am just a little bit confused regarding the beginning of the lecture. So, if the if the fruit <laughs> is not of the tree, is not of the tree. And he touches, God forbid, the corpse or some other impurity. It, it's because it's not kosher to become impure, it doesn't become impure. That's right. In order to become impure, it has to be off the tree and in touch with a liquid, one of the seven liquids. Right. So if you harvest it off the tree, it's been dry <laughs> weather and uh, it didn't touch any of the liquids, it's, it's, it cannot become impure. Exactly. No matter what it touches. Exactly. I got you. So what I, I so what I miss is the part where where the significance of that law. The significance of the law has to touch the liquid. What is the significance to our to our serving the Hashem? Uh, well there, I'm sure there is significance we can find, <laughs> but in the plain reason it's just part of the the laws of Tuma in general are, are in the category of chukim, laws that do not necessarily need to make common sense. Those are the things that God... Rabbi, you froze. Oh, so, so this is super rational law. Exactly. That's part of the super rational laws. So, uh, but I was, I'm trying to tie the beginning of, of your lecture. Of so so, so the... The, the 
that was only leading to the point of what is considered a liquid. And then and one of the seven liquids was the honey. And that's how we ended up that the Mishnah chooses to end the entire Mishnah with that particular law of when does the honey become a liquid. So we ask the question, why finish the entire Torah with that particular law? It must be symbolic. Right, okay, okay. So now the, okay. sim- the symbolism is that this is ultimately how we are supposed to serve Hashem, is like the honeys, like the bees. I got it. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Okay.